Hello, everyone, and welcome to the 2021 Braille Challenge webinar series. This is our fourth webinar in the series presented by the Mass Commission for the Blind, providing an overview of setting career goals and taking steps to get there. My name is Rachel Antoine. I am the Manager of National Programs and Services at the Braille Institute. We will be hearing from our presenters shortly, but I'd like to start with a little house cleaning and announcement. First of all, thank you all for being here. This year has presented new challenges for everyone, but that has not stopped our, our amazing Braille students from taking the Braille Challenge. As with many aspects of life, the Braille Challenge looks a little different this year. Normally, Braille Challenge Regionals are large, in-person, single-day events. We partner with organization, organizations across North America to bring over 50 Braille Challenge Regionals to over 1,200 students. This year, we have been overwhelmed by the commitment, innovation, and dedication from our partners and the full Braille Challenge Network in bringing this program to students in new ways. Regionals are hosting local Braille Challenges in a variety of formats, from limited in-person to remote, through the mail, fully virtual, and combinations of all three. For students who are unable to participate in their local challenge, there is always an option for teachers to order contests individually to proctor to their students, and this year we have seen teachers step up to the plate. So a huge thank you to everyone who supports the Braille Challenge, from the regional coordinators, the staff, teachers, volunteers, families, donors, and the full network of support for the students we serve. Thank you also to our prize sponsors, Humanware, Seedlings, Braille Books for Children, and Mattel, who donated Braille Uno cards for all BC contestants. Thank you also to our Braille Challenge team here at the Braille Institute. I could not ask for a better team to work with. This international program truly cannot be possible without this international community. And all of this is for the Braille students that we serve. So now huge congratulations to all the students who have already taken their contests and good luck to all those who are going to take their contests soon. You're gonna face many new challenges in life, but just by taking the challenge, you are already a winner. And when you face those challenges, remember to keep calm and Braille on. Now it is my pleasure to introduce our fourth webinar of the series presented by the team from the oldest blindness organization in the country, the Massachusetts Commission for the Blind. Commissioner Dark Angelo was the keynote for our final ceremony last year and gave a powerful speech on perseverance. We're still getting comments on it. So our presenters today are from the Employment Services Department at MCD. Joe Buzon studied at Bridgewater State College, earning a BA in social work. Since college, Joe has worked at MGH, and for the past 12 years at MCB, first as a rehab teacher and then as a social worker. Joe went to grad school at UMass Boston, earning a degree in vocational rehabilitation. Currently, Joe is an employment services supervisor, working with individuals who are visually impaired and seeking employment. He is married with two rambunctious sons and plays beat ball with the Boston Renegades. Carol Cullins has worked <clears throat> as an employment service services specialist with the Massachusetts Commission for the Blind since 2014, where she connects employers with qualified job candidates who have vision impairments. She previously worked as an assistant director of enrollment management and director of alumni affairs with Mount Wachusett Community College, <laughs> as well as a director of sales and member services with the North Central Massachusetts Chamber of Commerce. Carol holds a master's degree in nonprofit management from Worcester State University and a bachelor's degree in marketing with a minor in corporate communication from Bentley College. Welcome, welcome, Joe and Carol. Now take it away. Good morning, everyone. Afternoon, everyone, and, and soon to be good night, wherever you guys are across the country. Thank you so much, Rachel, for making this happen today. We miss you here in the uh, wonderful state of Massachusetts. And thank you all for taking your time and being here today and hopefully providing uh, some information from us to you in this give and go uh, conversation. We are just very excited to be here in this webinar to tell you about Massachusetts, about the Commission for the Blind, what we do, but the most important is how these services can be replicated if they're not already in your backyard. This aha moment of, oh, I didn't know that that was helpful and maybe let me seek out resources in my state, my city, my town. So that's our takeaway that hopefully, and I feel confident that you'll get from this presentation today. As Rachel had mentioned, my name is Joe Buzon. 
longtime employee at the agency, and now kind of moving forward and passing it forward in terms of our knowledge um, with the Commission for the Blind, which throughout the, the presentation will refer to the agency as MCB. With that said, is keeping your sight on the future and setting career goals and taking steps towards that is, is kind of the title. But the Commission for the Blind as a whole, as Rachel had mentioned, and I'm always proud to say this, is one of the commissions is one of the oldest commissions in the country starting in 1906. We started with three commissioners. Believe it or not, one of them, yes, was Helen Keller herself. And you'll see from the slide that it's the evolution of the Commission for the Blind. Uh, to date, 1966 is when we really started where we are currently today in the sense that we are one of the 15 agencies under the big umbrella, exec, under the umbrella of the Executive Office of Health and Human Services. The mission of the Commission for the Blind is to really to provide the highest quality of rehabilitation and social services to individuals who are legally blind, leading towards independent and full participation in their community. I am an example of that. I lost my vision at the rare age or ripe age of 16. Apparently it was a gift to me, right? But I embraced that diversity and was able to push forward and persevere as Commissioner Dark Angelo um, continues to say because of this agency. And now being on the other side of the fence, it's truly a honor to continue to spread that knowledge, the experience, and to the millions of people who benefit from services like the Commission for the Blind. One thing I did not mention, what we're going to do is Carol and I are gonna be ping-ponging back and forth, soaking up all the synergy and going from slide to slide. However, if you have any questions at all, feel free to put them in the chat, raise your hand, or put yourself off mute and just say your name and what's your inquiry but we will have a Q&A at the end. So if you'd like to wait then, um, we wanna make sure that we're flexible and really answer any inquiries that you have moving forward. So what I want to do now is kick it over to you, Carol. All right, hello everyone. So um, we're just gonna provide you just a little bit of an overview of our agency, just so you kind of have an understanding of who we are and um, you know, kind of what we do, how we serve our um, consumers, and then we're going to spend the bulk of the time, of course, providing information on things that you can do. Um, so as an overview of our services, uh, we've got uh, three different service units. We've got the children's unit, or, well, four, the children's unit, the social rehabilitation unit, the deafblind extended support unit, and the vocational rehabilitation unit. The vocational rehabilitation unit is the unit where we reside. Um, under the vocational, we meeting employment services, and then um, under the vocational rehabilitation unit would be um, the vocational rehabilitation teachers uh, and counselors, uh, employment services specialists, orientation and mobility uh, instructors, and assistive technology. Within the employment services department, we, we have in services for employers. So we will actually go out and visit with employers or maybe not physically now, we would do it over Zoom and talk with them about our services and the ways that we can provide, um, you know, assistance for job seekers who get jobs with, uh, you know, with their organizations, the types of support that we provide to them. Um, we kind of dispel the myths of visual impairment. Uh, we also will participate in and also run job fairs. So we'll participate in general job fairs and bring in our, our um, job seekers. And then we also run an annual job fair for individuals who are visually impaired. And we work with the job seekers to help prepare them for those job fairs. Um, we look for our mock interview opportunities with our consumers. Uh, in some cases, those mock interviews are being held um, 
by us over Zoom. In some cases, they're with community partners, and in some cases, they're with employers. And those are good things for you all to kind of look for, for people that you work with, for yourselves if you're a, a job seeker, uh, for your children if you're a parent, um, whatever the case may be. Um, those mock interview opportunities are very, very important. Um, we have an internship program that we run every year. We're right in the midst of, of um, recruitment for that right now. Um, we have anywhere from 70 to about uh, close to 100 interns that are placed in internship opportunities with both public and private nonprofit organizations throughout the state of Massachusetts. Um, last year, there were a little bit less, as you may know, there is a pandemic uh, right now. And that kind of, you know, put a little bit of a, a, a wrench into our plans, but um, we still had about, I think, 45, 46 interns last year. So it actually still worked out pretty well. We just had to backpedal, scramble, and, you know, for some who already had places, we had to um, look for new placements for some um, people um, and look for, in many cases, virtual opportunities. Um, we also have an Employment Now program, which is a program that um, is for ages from 16 to 22, where these individuals, I'm sorry, that's the youth council, I'm, I'm skipping over a little bit, um, and the mentor program, those two programs um, really work with individuals who are younger and are trying to connect with, um, you know, network with other people who are similar to them. Uh, with the youth council, they may be going to events with other people who are visually impaired for the mentor program. They may be working with individuals who have already gone through the employment process. So now they have a mentor that they can connect with through email, through um, phone calls, over Zoom. And, you know, when the pandemic goes away in person, you know, someone that they can sort of lean on who's felt the same frustrations that they may have felt um, or that they may be feeling as they're looking for employment. Um, the Employment Now program is another program that our agency runs where we have a cohort of individuals, there's four people per cohort, um, that are working in a local hospital and they um, have some dedicated job coaches who help them uh, navigate different departments within the hospital. Um, they will do a long-term internship about six months and, um, you know, just kind of get a sense of, uh, you know, what it's like to work in these different departments. They learn their soft skills um, and these job coaches work with them regularly on looking for employment as well. And of course, we partner with the Carroll Center for the Blind, Perkins School for the Blind, and so many other community partners that, um, you know, we, we work with very closely in many, many uh, projects throughout the year. Um, so, as you know, um, or I imagine many of you know, there's only about 44% of individuals who are blind and visually impaired that are employed, uh, compared to 79% of individuals without disabilities. That is frustrating. So we know it's kind of an uphill battle. Um, the individuals that we work with could have the best skills in the world and they're still competing with people who are sighted. It's a challenge. It's heart-wrenching. It's frustrating. Um, but there are things that these people can do, and this is what we really want to bring home to you today. So it's very important to research jobs that you're looking for. Really do the research. Now, where might you start research? I mean, the, the obvious starting point would be to go to Indeed, right? Um, of course, Indeed is a very common place for people to research jobs. But where else might you go? Maybe your college campus or high school guidance office. Um, maybe, you know, check with friends and neighbors. Think about the networks that, that you have, both in the vision related community and otherwise. Um, there are many ways that you can find these types of jobs. If you're at, you know, I hate to say a get together, it could be over Zoom with family and friends. They may know someone who knows someone. Those are those networks. Those networks are very important. And then you also may be um, reaching out through Facebook, through LinkedIn, anything like that. Um, as you're looking through jobs, understand the job description. I can't stress this enough. Understanding the job description is crucial. There are minimum qualifications that individuals must meet. 
you have to meet those minimum qualifications in order for uh, jobs, uh, you know, a hiring manager to even consider you. If those job, those minimum qualifications, even if it's one or two are not met, then typically a human resources organization or department is going to, you know, put that resume or that application in the do not interview pile because those minimum qualifications have not been met. If it's a preferred qualification, that's a different story. If you meet the, the, the minimum requirements, but you, maybe you don't meet all of the preferred, that's okay. Of course, the more requirements you meet, the better. On the other hand, if you are at the stage where you're just exploring jobs, you're not ready to work yet. Um, you're not out there you know, ready to apply for jobs. You're just trying to figure out kind of what to do and how to get there. Do the research, research those jobs and research those job descriptions. Look at those minimum qualifications and figure out what you need to do to get to those minimum qualifications. Do you need to take a different course at school? Do you need to take an Excel course? Do you need to, um, you know, just develop any particular soft skills? Think about that really carefully. Maybe even reach out to the employer and ask, can I do, have an informational interview where you can just simply learn about the organization and kind of what types of skills that those employers are looking for. That is all very helpful um, information to have as you develop your job searching toolkit. Resume development, as you probably know, is very important as well. There is not a one size fits all. It's very important to develop a resume that is very much tailored to the job that you are applying for. That doesn't mean lie. Um, what that means is, and, and what I recommend often to job seekers is have a resume that's sort of a template. And then, so it has everything, everything, all of the skills, all of the education, all of the jobs, and, and you know, that resume may be pretty long. Um, then once you see the job that you want to apply for, pull out the skills that are really relevant to that particular job. That would bring your resume down to hopefully the one or two pages. Um, if you have minimal experience or no work experience, you want it down to one page. There's really no reason to have two pages in that case. Um, on the other hand, if it's two pages and then maybe, you know, it just boils over to the third page very slightly, um, but every bit of information in there is important. That's okay too. It's, it's some people get so hung up on the two pages that they leave out important information. You don't want to leave out important information, but you want to try to keep it to a page or two if possible. Um, so now when you're writing a resume and you are looking at the skills for the job, when you've got those skills, you can highlight them on your resume. Um, you can omit anything that's not relevant to make the page, um, to make it page, you know, size appropriate. Um, to look for assistance with that, you can go to your, usually the high school guidance office, career services office, any of the career centers throughout the state um, should have resources as well. So you wanna look for resources to help you write that cover, that um, resume, because that needs to be very well done and it needs to be succinct and it needs to be error free. If you need someone to take a look at it for formatting, that's important as well. So make sure that the formatting is correct and that it's easy to read. Writing a cover letter is also very important. And I know a lot of people think, oh, if I'm gonna write a cover letter, I'll just sort of reinstate what's in the resume. While that you know, is okay, it's better than doing nothing. The better option is to really highlight and emphasize the things that you couldn't put in your resume because it maybe it wouldn't fit. A resume is a tool, to, it's a marketing tool. It's a piece of paper that makes these hiring managers, HR and so forth, want to learn more about you. It gets you through the HR process, you know, the HR screeners to the hiring manager. A cover letter is really what's gonna make them want to interview you. So let me give you an example. Say you're working in a museum or you have experience working in a museum as a coordinator of volunteer services, for example, of the volunteers. So you have on your resume that you recruit people and to, to volunteer for programs and events and that maybe you manage a database. 
Well, your resume, you don't want to just say, I recruit people and manage a database because that's redundant. Then what's the point of the resume? I mean, of the cover letter. So with the cover letter, you may say something like, you know, I, um, over the past year, I have recruited 250 volunteers for five different events. And one event consisted of, you know, name it, you know, whatever the case may be, um, maybe hanging signs, maybe welcoming people, whatever the case may be for that event. Um, and you can give more details. You can talk about the frequency of events if you've recruited individuals for, um, you know, a recurring event that happens maybe monthly at the museum, for example. Um, and then you can talk about other things. I developed a training manual for uh, the volunteers, for example. So those are, that's information you can add to the cover letter that shows more about you, that tells more about you than the resume does. And in that cover letter, um, again, you want to really look at what the job wants uh, that you're applying for and make sure that those are the types of things that you say. Oh, like at your job, at your company, um, you're looking for someone who um, does recruiting. Maybe it's a different type of recruiting. Well, you know, just like what you're looking for, I have done. That's what you want to think of. What you're looking for, I have done in some way or another. Obviously, you don't put it into those words, but that's the premise. What you are looking for, I have done, and let me explain how. So if you can kind of keep that in mind um, so that you can tailor it to the job, that will help you to do uh, even a better job. The job interview. Um, of course, right now we're doing a lot of job interviews over Zoom and other electronic um, types of platforms. So uh, video conferencing is very popular right now during this pandemic. Put your video on. You know, you don't have to for webinars and things like that, but when you're doing a job interview, you're attending a job interview, you want that video on. The employers, the hiring managers, the interview committee, they're gonna be looking at you and your body language. Your body language says a lot. Words are only something like 7% of communication. So body language is important. They'll wanna know, I mean, we, we all know that um, eye, eye contact is a challenge for our population. That's understandable. It can be depending on the level of vision. If you're in a live interview, you wanna try to face your body as best you can to people who are talking. Not always easy to do, but if you have that ability, then you wanna do that. Over Zoom, you're just gonna face forward. You wanna make sure you're centered in the screen. You wanna make sure that, and practice with someone if you, if you can, make sure you're centered, check yourself first. Um, and smile, use your body language, make sure you're sitting up tall and you look engaged because if you're down, if your head's down, you look bored to them. And, and they're gonna say, we don't want someone who's bored at our job. We want somebody who's enthusiastic and is really looking for this position. Dress for success. Now, you know, Joe and I, we're color coordinated, that's not planned, but <laughs> um, you know, Joe has on a, a black jacket, a white shirt and a burgundy bow tie. I have a burgundy blouse. Neither one of us will tell you what, we're, what else we're wearing because it doesn't matter. You're not going to see it over Zoom, right? So we could have on pajamas and buddy, bunny pants. slippers. We could have on <laughs> um, jeans. We could have on very, you know, dress slacks. Who knows? On a Zoom or, a, you know, some sort of video conferencing platform, obviously that's not going to be seen unless you have to get up in an emergency. Think about that for a minute. Um, so you always want to prepare and over-prepare. Um, but you definitely want to dress the part, even if you're, you know, sitting in your own home doing an interview and it feels casual, make yourself, bring yourself out of your comfort zone and make yourself dress up and feel professional. You want to dress the part of the position that you are seeking. And obviously, if it's an on-site interview, you have to dress, you know, head to toe, comfortable shoes, make sure your footwear is appropriate for the job. If you're working in food service or banking or hospitality, most of the time you need closed-toed shoes. Um, you know, it, you just have to really think about that. Um, and then, you know, once your interview is done, a thank you note goes a long way. 
And so you send that thank you note to the hiring manager, try to get the contact information of, of everybody in the interview if you're able to, and send a thank you note. It can be one email that goes out to all of them, thanking them for the opportunity, letting them know that you're enthusiastic and you're really looking forward to the next step in the process and reiterate anything that you think was really important that you wanna make sure they didn't forget about you. You also have the opportunity now to maybe add something that you might've forgotten. I don't know how many of us, I'm sure many of us actually, have left an interview and went, oh, darn it, I wish I said this or that. So that's your opportunity to say, you know, and by the way, I also can offer this. Or by the way, I managed, you know, five people at this job or whatever the case may be. So, um, so use that thank you note. Uh, and I have to give you a quick funny story. A, a friend of mine years ago had applied for a job and she was chewing gum through the interview. She was so nervous. She didn't even think about it until it was, this was years ago. She sent a thank you note and she stuck a stick of gum in her thank you note. I mean, this was with mail at the time, but um, she got the job. It was a sales job. And I think they were just so pleased that she thought enough to catch her error and she used it to her advantage and they hired her. So, you know, that's something to think about. You know, if you do a misstep somewhere, um, again, we're all human, things happen. You can be strategic and use that to your advantage. Depends on what it is, of course, but um, something to keep in mind. And then soft skills on the job. Um, that's something we also reinforce with our job seekers from when they're in the internship program, starting in the internship program. Every intern has to um, attend a soft skills training every year. So we really reinforce these. So all of the job searching skills that I just mentioned and applying to a job, you also need these soft skills. So we hear from employers that, you know, some candidates come in with, and this is across the board. This isn't just the blindness community. This is across the board. Um, they come in and they have the work skills, the hard skills that they need to get the job done, but they don't have soft skills. So appropriate workplace behavior, um, you know, is it appropriate to, you know, come into work, if you're working on site, come into work, um, punch in, if you're punching a time clock, go get your coffee, hang up your coat, maybe run to the cafe and grab a sandwich, um, talk to your friends, then come back and sit down to work. No, now you're starting maybe a half hour late. What you really want to do is do all that stuff before you clock in and clock in a little bit early and be ready at your work site you know, by the time you're supposed to be there. So if you're scheduled for nine o'clock, you are there with your logged on to your computer, if that's your job, and ready to go at nine o'clock. You're not just rushing in and, you know, at the at you know, quarter past nine, nine thirty. Um, you know, communicate with your your communication is part of it. Communicate with your coworkers appropriately. Um, we've had individuals, you know, want to, you know, talk with us about sending emails to, with to their coworkers to go out and go hang out after work. And, you know, that may be appropriate, but not right away and not with your supervisor. And so you have to kind of know the culture before, before you do things like that. So appropriate communication that way, um, but also appropriate communication. If you're sending emails through work, it should be professional. It should um, have no spelling errors, that sort of thing. Attendance, you should be on time. You should have a sense of when your breaks are um, and not just take a break. And you shouldn't be at work looking like you're taking a break all the time. Um, and then of course, just like you need to dress for success for an interview, you wanna make sure your work attire is appropriate. If you're not sure, the best to be modest in the beginning until you know the work culture. And that, then that leads me to the next bullet is work culture. Every workplace is different. There are some workplaces where you can go in and you can be dressed in a t-shirt and shorts in the summertime um, and sneakers and it's okay. And there are other workplaces where you need to be in a jacket and a tie. So knowing that work culture um, is very important for both work attire, but also just how everybody interacts with each other and how they communicate with each other. But again, emails, phone calls, with colleagues should be professional as, as well as um, externally. And now I will send it over to Joe. All right, well, thank you, Carol. A uh, couple of things before we go right into networking. Uh, it's it's kind of what 
Carol had mentioned is soft skills, right? Those intangibles, people call them interpersonal skills or emotional intelligence. It's basically the things that you can't really measure. When I was in my youth and, and kind of understanding my own blindness and in high school, I really didn't know what that meant. So it's really important to drive that point home and to realize those both hard skills and soft skills, if you have both, you'll be very marketable. So networking, right? What, what is networking? Why is it important? Many of you probably heard and will continue to hear and I'm preaching to the converted to, to some of you is, is it's not what you know, it's who you know, right? But it's everything in between that. I'm a firm believer that it's definitely both. And Carol had kind of read off the statistics earlier that people with disabilities, it's just facts, right? They, they, it's harder. You're, you're, you're fighting an uphill battle, but you have to be resilient, right? You have to have, be persistent. I always say this Department of Employment Services, we house internships, mentorships, employment now initiatives that are kind of like a hybrid between employment and an internship experience. Um, and, and the list goes on from job shadows is all of those things. And then some, even with a whole army behind you with the Commission for the Blind or Vote Rehab, you still may not get a job right away. It may take you a year or two or three. So the importance of networking is kind of figuring out where you are, whether you're youth or you're a more mature adult or you're an advocate and you're helping that youth is where's the circle of the person I'm working with or if you self-reflect, for example, so I mentioned I lost my vision at 16. Right now, my birthday's coming up. Happy birthday to me. I'm going to March 8th. I'm going to be 38. I tell you that because hopefully it helps and gives you a little bit of, of who I am and where I came from. And then the people that we serve is, okay, I lost my vision. Everybody's working, right? The 15 to 16 years old, that's where you can get your permit, at least here in Massachusetts. And I said, goodness, I lost my vision right when I wanted to get a job, right when I got my permit. I wanna blend in with our community. So I, my social worker then, right, going back to our, our friends in the community that are allies, is the Boys and Girls Club, your local YMCA, your municipality, because they know me, I've been there before. I was a, uh, uh, a patron where I went there to kind of do my homework or uh, do recreational things. So I interviewed and I got the job, but they knew me prior. Pre-blindness, I worked at Market Basket. There's the Boston accent, right? Which is your local kind of grocery store. If you have a Demoulas or a Star Market or Stop and Shop around you. I was losing my vision, but how I got that job was my sister. She worked in the courtesy booth. So I worked there for a little bit. I was a cashier. Then I worked my way downwards to a bagger because I couldn't see the register anymore. So it's more than just kind of collecting business cards or being on Facebook or Instagram or social media with LinkedIn and how many friends you are, have. It's whether you're an introvert or an extrovert or a type A or type B, if you can really do your best now and start to foster and steward those relationships to figure out, okay, I'm not just gonna reach out to Rachel because I need something, right? And go, how's California? I love the weather, but have, have I talked to her during the holiday to send her a quick text or a message on LinkedIn saying, how have you been? If and when you ever come back to Massachusetts and you're available, love to have coffee on me, right? And, and something like that. And, and kind of, if you bring it back to more of the youth, is what's your passion? What's your blind brand, if you will? Because this all leads to networking. Because what are you selling? You're selling yourself. Right? You're selling your skills um, and everything about you. So I would initially start with, okay, do I play sports? Do I like to read? Um, do I go to a religious uh, place of worship? Um, where does my mom and dad work? I can tell when I remember, God, my dad was a machinist. I don't really remember what that was other than when I went to go visit during uh, Bring Your Family Day. Um, have a good grip on what they do. I haven't had trouble because the last time. Um, so okay. things of that sort. Um, and, and then you can market if you're a Braille reader. 
Um, if you're a JAWS user, voiceover or Zoom text, because kind of what's your elevator speech, right? So right. I work for the Commission for the Blind. I've been there for 15 years plus, and I basically help individuals get employment, whether big or small, and we do that in these various ways. Can we chat? So it's a softer sell in terms of uh, speaking to individuals, right? And, it, and it's something quick, something fast. Carol had mentioned the youth council earlier. And that's where at the agency, once upon a time when we got people together and we went to Fenway Park or we went to the Boston Tea Party, all of these things. Um, but the main goal was to get yourself closer to your goal of work. Um, and then you can put these things on your resume, your references. So other ways is to know who your teacher is, right? So they can be a reference for you if and when you apply to college. So they can vouch for your kind of work ethic, your reliability, being a team player, a lot of these buzz buzzwords that you probably hear now and you'll hear in years to come. One thing I do recommend, and at my time of adjustment, I kind of didn't want to do it as much, but to try to engage with people, which you probably are, because if you're doing national braille contests, is interact with people who are visually impaired like yourself. You may ask why? It's because probably, and for those that are teachers or helping people who are visually impaired, that's probably the one student in that elementary school or that one student in high school, that one or two people on that entire college campus. So you're gonna stick out, right? Most likely, and you don't want to, uh, but then just embrace your di diversity. It's easier said than done. But if you start now, which you probably already are, it's only gonna get easier as it's a part of your identity. So some of the things that you may have heard of advocate groups is National Federation for the Blind, also America's, um, Americans Council for the Blind, rather. There should be chapters where you are. Check it out. See what they're about. Is there um, something that may interest you? They may be on listservs. You may be able to meet someone because they know what you're kind of experiencing to an extent. So when, if you're straddling both worlds in terms of being diverse and legal blind and low vision, and then also being part of unquote, quote, mainstream. If you're able to marry the two, you're guaranteed to be successful. Right. The next slide is learning by doing, which goes hand in hand with networking, is we are very proud in Massachusetts at the Commission for the Blind with our internship program that's been going strong, I think for 15, 16 years, if not more. I'm a proud product of that program way back when in 2002 where I did my internship at a hospital in speech pathology. I don't even know what that was, right? But I did research then. I tried to do my best to figure out what I was getting myself into, but the agency was still standing that program up. And now it's one of our premier programs that uh, Carol touched upon it a little bit, but I'll provide some more details where it's a summer internship, usually starts June, July, and August. It's for seniors and up in high school. And that means undergrad or in your master's, even for mature adults who possibly lose their vision later in life. And our goal is to get them back out in the community, of course, pre-pandemic, but even now, right? As long as it's done responsibly. <clears throat> to hit your alarm every day, whether that back then was an iPhone, right? Hit the snooze two or three times, but make sure you get up. Make sure you take the bus and train. Over here, it's the MBTA. Or take paratransit. Or have a loved one bring you. And we talked about the soft skills and make sure you greet people appropriately. Good morning. How are you? How was the weekend? But then you don't want to greet everyone for 10 minutes because by the time you do that, you'll be late for work, right? Different things in terms of canes, seeing eye dogs. I mentioned all of this because this is the package that I talked about when you unpackage yourself in front of your colleagues to, to share, but not overshare. goes back to the interpersonal skills. The internship we booked and both of them with an opening, um, booked them, the program rather, with an opening ceremony in June as a kickoff event, usually with 80 interns. They go, my name is Joe Buzon. I'm doing an internship at National Braille Press, and I am a rising junior at Harvard University. I didn't go to Harvard, but maybe my kids will. <laughs> so essentially, what we want to do is get them 
used to using a mic microphone, introducing themselves. And then they hear from speakers. Um, typically lunch is provided at times, but not via Zoom. MCB was able to pivot very quickly and adjust to our new norm. Is it perfect? No. Uh, is it good? You're darn right it is. Um, and a lot of people have replicated the internship program all across the country in other vocational rehab uh, places. So I encourage you to pose the question or, or ask me and Carol because all of our contact information will be there. Then we have a closing ceremony where we invite all of the supervisors and then a loved one comes. Honestly, it's, it's a big, big deal, which we make it. It's like almost a wedding where we have a seating chart. There's almost 250 people. We have distinguished guests that come and we have past, this is the beauty, past interns who have participated, who are now fully employed, benefits, Monday through Friday working, whatever the salary may be. And then they talk about their experience for five minutes and the importance of internship and why it's something you should heavily consider. And then usually our keynote speaker is also visually impaired. It's not a requirement, but because we but we want to make sure that um, you know they're they're not just saying do as I say and not as I do, if that makes sense. So in a nutshell, that's the networking, that's the internship, the soft skills uh, that I wanted to mention, and, and the importance of it all. Um, I just want to say one more thing to them before I pass it over to Carol. Is kind of dressing for success. It, it's it's I, it's so important, right? They say don't dress for the position now, but dress for your next position. Think a little bit bigger if you want to. Um, and the, the piece with that is you can always add your own flair, right? I, I never wore bow ties, but I'm like, you know what? Let me try to wear bow ties. Carol told me bow ties are cool. So I said, <laughs> let me try to wear burgundy bow ties. So you can always do something that's comfortable for you and make sure that you learn kind of the blindisms. And what I mean by that, Carol referred to it a little bit earlier. I got on at 1.45 and I said, Carol, am I, am I straight? Because I can't see the screen. And I had a, I had a meeting before that uh, regarding our internship, coincidentally enough, because we're in the heart of it and it wasn't perfect. So you only can kind of see this up. So I had to make sure I could adjust. And when you shake someone's hand right now, of, of course, with the pandemic and that may or may not ever come back, is my hands out. Right? Or you put your hands out for, put your hand out first so the person who's not visually impaired can be comfortable. Fortunately, unfortunately, our role as people who are visually impaired and in this in this community as a whole, which is small but mighty, is to make the people around us feel very comfortable because at times what you don't know, you don't know, and can, that can be a little bit scary. So with all that, I want to now toss it back over to you, Carol. All right, thanks, Joe. Um, so just to kind of sum it up, um, I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the um, search tools that we use and the preparation for our job seekers. So I mentioned earlier that we have an annual job fair for individuals with visual impairment. We're actually working on that right now. So um, Joe and I, as the employment services team, are reaching out, and I talked about partners earlier. So we actually partner with the Carroll Center for the Blind, Prepared School for the Blind, um, and, and others, uh, some employers as well. And we work on this job fair. We're, rec we're all, everybody on this committee, all those different organizations are reaching out to employers to recruit them to participate in the job fair. And we're at the same time reaching out to the individuals with visual impairment and we're helping to prepare them, you know, have them work on their 60 second elevator. That is very important. We didn't talk too much about that today, but basically in, you know, 60 seconds, 30 seconds in some cases, it's called an elevator pitch because you should be able to um, get on the first floor in an elevator. And by the time you get to your destination and elevators can be pretty quick, you've told them the important things about yourself, such as, you know, my name is Carol Collins. I'm a, a graduate of Worcester State University with a master's degree in nonprofit management, and I'm searching for a job in, in employment services, and here are my qualifications, basically. So, you know, something to that effect. So we're working with the job seekers on that, as well as resume development, as well as having them apply to open positions 
with the employers that are going to be at that job fair because when they introduce themselves and they have a few minutes to or a minute 60 seconds to 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 talk they can say oh and by the way i applied for a position so that will pique the interest of the employers um we also partner very closely with the mass hire one-stop career centers so there are career centers all over the, the country and um, it's very important to connect with them um, because they have partners, they have employer partners that they're working with and they have career counselors. So you can connect with an agency that specializes with people with vision impairments, such as you know, a state agency, um, but you should also work with the mainstream the, the uh, career centers because they have other partners as well. And it's very likely that the agencies in your area are connecting with those career centers as well. So they're getting a little bit of education. And if they're not, then, you know, if you have the ability to educate them a little bit, even better. Um, and, you know, there are job fairs and career fairs at colleges and high schools. We encourage our job seekers and our students to participate. And whenever possible, we will attend with them. If that means it's over Zoom, then that's fine. In some cases, you know, it's live, not as much now, but we would attend with them so that we can help them navigate. If, um, I don't know how many of you have been to job fairs, but they can be overwhelming even as a sighted person. So if you're losing a little bit of vision, then, you know, it can be even more challenging trying to read which table is which, where the person is, who is manning the table and so forth. And then with Zoom, sometimes there are challenges there as well. We also um, participate and partner with some regional employment collaboratives that are in Massachusetts. I don't know that there are a lot of these throughout the country. Um, we're very fortunate in Massachusetts to have several of them um, in each region um, where, you know, they're Basically, the purpose of these, collab these collaboratives is um, to work with people with disabilities, all different types of disabilities, and helping them to find employment. So our agency will participate. Another agency who works with people with other physical disabilities may participate. Another agency who works with people who have um, cognitive disabilities may participate, mental health issues, addiction, whatever the case may be. And we all network and we meet and we share leads. You know, one lead that we often will share is, oh, a company that we partner with is looking for drivers. You know, it's obvious that our agency won't be able to provide drivers, but somebody else in that collaborative may be able to. And then they may have other jobs that they'll share with us and so forth. So those regional collaboratives are fantastic. And again, they have their own partners that they're developing as we as an agency are developing our partnerships as well, uh, employer partners. And then we're always looking for opportunities for you to meet informally with human resources professionals for resume tips and critiquing, tips and networking. So, um, you know, they'll, they, we have a lot of hospitals in our area. So we have a lot of connections with hospitals um, in this part of the, the country. So we'll connect with, you know, either human resources person, a uh, human resources specialist or um, recruiter, or even a hiring manager partner. And we'll ask if they have time to talk with the job seeker and, you know, critique their resume so that they're not just hearing it from us because we end up being like their moms and dads after a while, but that these, the, these um, people are able to hear it from the people who have hire, make hiring decisions as well. And also to um, do mock interviews and informational interviews, and they're different, they're very different. So informational interviews really would be where a job seeker would go into an organization that is an organization they have a very strong interest in, an industry that they have an interest in. So maybe they want to work in a hospital, they don't know, you know, necessarily which hospital. So we'll connect them with somebody with a hospital, you know, at a hospital and talk about whatever it is that they need to do to prepare themselves for working in a hospital. Um, whether that means touching up their resume, whether that means taking certain classes or just building their skills in a particular area. And at the same time, that person at that hospital, that you know, hiring manager or human resources professional is getting a glimpse at the abilities and the skill set of that person 
that individual with vision impairment who's sitting right in front of them or over Zoom. So it's great. Um, and then mock interviews, it could be almost any industry where these individuals can just practice their interviewing skills. And as I mentioned earlier, sometimes we'll have them do that with us. Sometimes we have them do it with, you know, the regional employment collaborators, for example, they'll offer um, to do that so that they're interviewing, they're practicing their interview skills with somebody that they don't know, it's very important. But if we can be strategic about it, and if you can be strategic about it, you pick out a company that you have an interest in, you say, I just want to practice my interview skills. And then, you know, maybe a year down the line, you graduate, you're ready to work, you look for a job there, and they'll hopefully remember you. So um, those, those are uh, just some of the many, many ways that we partner with, um, with employers in the community. So we will open it up for questions now. I am going to just, for a few minutes, pull up our thank you and our contact information in case you need to re reach us. I'm going to close this out in a moment so that, you know, we can, I can't see the chat in this mode. So um, this way we can check the questions. So let me just leave this open for a moment. Thank you, Joe and Carol, for that engaging and informative presentation. Um, if anyone has any questions, feel free to type them in the chat or to just unmute yourself and um, speak. But um, thank you so much. You're welcome, Rachel. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. So don't be shy. Just unmute yourself and ask any questions. Um, Or if you think of something later, you can always email me or email um, Carol and Joe directly and they'll follow up. But um, I'll be taking any questions now or later and then I will um, let them know that it wasn't asked during the presentation. But uh, just feel free to unmute yourself and ask your question. And I just added the um, contact information. It didn't come out Right, I tried to copy and paste it, but um, I just added our contact information, our emails and phone numbers in the chat, in case you're interested. Hello? Yes. Hi. Hi, it's Jackie. I'm the resource specialist at Braille Institute. I just want to say thank you so much. Kudos to you for um, what your organization does for the visually impaired. And my question is, do you have a sister organization in California that does what you do for the visually impaired? So Jackie, thank you for A, introducing yourself and, and B, for your inquiry. We appreciate that and we welcome more. Uh, in terms of our sister agency, yes, in fact, that we have a similar entity uh, in the sense that it's a voc rehab agency uh, in California. So they may be something called like California's Rehab Commission or California's Rehab uh, Commission Division. Uh, so they may be uh, named differently, but each, each, um, rather, each state absolutely has something similar in their, um, where they are. The only difference is like, for example, our sister agency in Massachusetts is Mass Rehab Commission, but then we have Mass Commission for the Blind. So we are two different entities. We collaborate quite consistently, but there are other states that's under one big umbrella. So if you Google Voc Rehab in California, um, I feel confident something will come up. If you can't find anything, let us know and we can be your bridge. Thank you so much. I really enjoyed your presentation today. Thank you, Jackie. Appreciate those words. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> Bradley Day wrote a question in the chat. Um, question regarding online youth interviews for our youth. What do you recommend for some things that may be further out of the control of students? Background noise, internet connectivity, et cetera. Whoosh, that's a good one. For example, <laughs> in terms of just here, me not being a youth, I have youth in the house and, and, and I have a, a kind of a Somerville uh, living arrangement slash apartment condo. So for the youth specifically, try to be creative, the background noise, what you can do is just be creative, right? Every day, people who are visually impaired have to be creative. Like when I use my toothbrush, I just put it in my mouth. I don't put it on the toothbrush. Some people do that who are visually impaired. That's just not my style, right? So what you can do is give your answer, put yourself on mute, and then when you get the next uh, question, take yourself on mute. So then you're, you're taking control of the background noise behind you, 
putting yourself on mute and unmute. Will the employer see that? Yes. Is it better that they see you putting yourself on mute opposed to hearing a lot of stuff in the background? Number one. Number two, the other question was internet challenges. So that's an ongoing challenge, right? Earlier, my internet was going in and out and Carol couldn't hear me. Couple of, again, thinking outside of the box, depending on the pandemic, is to go somewhere where the um, internet is, is good. If you're able to travel to your local library, if you feel confident you can do that with the safety protocols, or go to a different house where you know you have family members or friends that have more reliable internet and not as much, much background noise. So I believe those were the two questions. Carol, if you have anything else, if I'm missing anything in that chat, other than those two specific ones, I can feel those as well. Yeah, so, um, you know, with regard to that question too, you know, one of the things that we tell the, the consumers is to practice first. Um, you know, before this meeting, you know, we're all in a, in a virtual world, many of us living at home, we have pets, kids, whatever. Um, so there's always going to be distractions. And so you kind of can't use that as an excuse. And many of us are in meetings, I'm sure many of you are in meetings, and you might see a cat walk across a keyboard or see a dog's tail, or see, you know, a spouse or a child walk past. Generally speaking, you know, that's okay. But for an interview, no. So um, you could ask my daughter, she's, she's 26 and also working remotely, or my husband that I've been telling them all day, keep, don't, please don't come out here at two o'clock. You know, I had meetings all day long, but I said, two o'clock is a presentation. Please don't come out here. Please keep the dog quiet. Joe has heard my dog many times barking. Mm -hmm. You know, please make sure for this meeting that, you know, it's quiet. We cannot have any distractions. So if someone's got a job interview, that first impression is crucial. So it's very important that they, they do that. Talk to their loved ones if, if, you know, if it's possible and have them, you know, for that first meeting to keep everything quiet. We're all human, things happen. But for that job interview, that first time, you want it to be as perfect as possible. Things happen, mistakes happen no matter what. But you want to try to minimize that as much as possible. And I do want to chime in very quickly. Carol practice what she preaches. Here in Massachusetts, we had like a semi-nor'easter with you know, rain, she's emailing me and Rachel very late night saying, if I lose power, Rachel and Joe, this is the, some of the stuff because uh, I may not be able to access it. Practice makes, uh, you know, practice makes perfectness. Um, but that's kudos to you, Carol. So that's something that she was doing yesterday uh, on a holiday. Absolutely, I know. I was like, oh no, I do not miss that New England smell. <laughs> Adam. Luckily, we didn't lose power. <laughs> we <laughs> well, have an ice you, storm out here you. this morning. So, <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I want to stick to the time. I know you guys have a busy schedule, but thank you so much, uh, Joe and Carol, for an informative and engaging presentation as always. And thank you, MCB, for this webinar. This was the fourth in our nine-part Braille Challenge webinar series, but be sure to tune into our next webinar titled Playful Experience for the Pre-Braille Instruction by American Printing House for the Blind. In, this, in that webinar, you'll learn how to use Lego bricks with pre-reading students, warning, imagination hard at work. That webinar is tomorrow at 10 a.m. Pacific, 1 p.m. Eastern. Once again, thank you to Joe and Carol and MCB, and thank you to everyone for joining. Congratulations and good luck to all our Braille Challenge contestants. We'll see you at the next webinar. <clears throat> Keep calm and Braille on. Thank you, everyone. Bye Thank bye. you. Take care. Thank you. Take care. Stay warm.